why don't you go out and get some fresh air, Barney dear? asked Grandmother. Barney stood and looked out of the window. Doesn't look very fresh to me, he grunted. A yellow fog hung over the trees outside. The smoke from the back kitchen chimney stirred itself into it, and there seemed to be a smell of distant cement works. Never mind, dear. It's better than stuffing indoors all day. All right, Granny, I'll go out. After about 20 minutes, he had found his jersey mixed up with his bedclothes, one outdoor shoe under the bed and the other one under the chest in the hall. He wandered out into the garden. It was neither warm nor cold and there was no wind at all. He made for the chalk pit whistling with his hands in his pockets. As he came near the edge of the pit, he stopped whistling and stood still. There were voices coming from the bottom of the pit, his pit. Well, perhaps it wasn't his pit. It didn't even belong to Grandfather, or did it? Perhaps holes in the ground didn't belong to anybody. All the same, he was quite annoyed that other people should be poking around the pit. He went cautiously to the edge and peeped over. Down there, among the tin cans and other rubbish, were three boys of about his own age or older, dressed in jerseys and trousers that were grubbier and more tattered than his own, and grey tennis shoes with holes in them. They all had long, rather greasy hair. Barney recognised them. They were the Snarget boys, part of a large family who lived in an old house with tarred weatherboards and were always getting into trouble. At least that was what the grown-ups said. But then, who didn't get into trouble? The Snargets seemed to be building some sort of shack for themselves out of dead branches and old sheets of corrugated iron, with a lot of horseplay and cries of, No! Not that way, clever! See, like this! Barney crawled to a place where a twisted tree trunk grew from the very edge of the cliff, hid himself behind it, broke off a handy-sized clod of clay and roots from the cliff edge, and hurled it at the roof of the shack. It curved through the air towards the target, but missed, and landed almost noiselessly on a mossy log. Barney chose himself another clod and threw it. This time it struck the bottom of an upturned pail and exploded like a little bomb, scattering bits of clay over one of the snargets. Here! Who's chucking dirt? cried the first snarget suspiciously. I never, said another snarget. Must have been him, he added, pointing to the third and youngest. Leave off, will ya? said the first snarget. Oh, I'll do, you see. I ain't done nothing, protested the youngest snarget. Oh, you didn't, did you? said the first. No, I never. Well, don't you do it again, that's all. At the top of the cliff, Barney, the cause of the trouble, chuckled to himself and broke off another clod. This time his aim was true, and the clod landed fair and square on the sheet of iron with a most satisfying clang. Three snarget heads popped out at once like ferrets out of rabbit holes. I told you someone was chucking dirt, said the first snarget. And I told you it wasn't me, said the youngest. They looked around, scowling at the floor of the pit. All right, it's no use hiding. We can see you, called the eldest snarget. Barney hugged himself in silence behind his tree trunk. He knew this was just bluff. They hadn't even looked in his direction. Sold out, but I bet, said the middle-sized snarget. He's been and followed us. We can see you, Albert, called the first snarget. Come on, that bush. Or we'll come and do ya. They were standing looking at the far end of the pit with their backs to Barney. With great care, Barney broke off as big a clod as he could find and aimed it again at the roof of the shack. It hit and exploded with another loud clang, scattering pieces over all three snargets, who ducked wildly and clutched at each other, and then looked foolish at being taken by surprise. They whispered fiercely among themselves, pointing at places on the cliff edge. Come from behind as he did. Now there he is. Don't be daft. He's up in those bashes. I tell you, I saw him. They all pointed in different directions at the edge of the cliff. It's all right, Albert, called the eldest snarget again. It's no use you hiding yourself up there. We're coming to get you. But this didn't worry Barney either. By the time they got to the top, he could be well away. The snargets must have thought this too, because they didn't make a move. They retired inside their rickety shack instead. Barney scored another direct hit on it and a near miss. Heads popped out each time and looked around fiercely but he was too well hidden and they failed to spot him. But there seemed to be a lot of whispering going on in the shack and then all three snargets came out and started walking towards the way out. 
The eldest called over his shoulder in a casual voice. Bye, Albert. And the other two repeated it. We're going home now, Albert, called the eldest. It's our dinner time. But well, listen here, Albert. We know you're up there. Just keep your hands off our shack, see? We've got something in there that's valuable. We just dare you to meddle with it. That's all. The Snargets walked off towards the way out of the pit, whistling loudly and banging tins with sticks. Barney waited until he could hear their feet on the lane dying away. Funny, he thought, they've gone. Still, perhaps it is their dinner time. He came out from behind his tree and went round the edge of the pit to the low side and walked along the bottom to the shack the Snargets had built. He wondered what the valuable thing was they had left in it. There didn't seem to be anything except a paper bag full of chestnut conkers. Ah, silly old conkers, said Barney aloud. They're not valuable. Perhaps they'd buried something. He dug around in the mossy floor and unearthed a very rusty tin box. It had writing on the outside. He could just make out the letters. Gold block, it said. It felt heavy. Ought he to open it or not? He decided he would. There was no harm in just looking. The hinged lid was rusted to the bottom and wouldn't move. He banged at it with a stone. Out fell a rusty mass of screws, nuts, bolts and curtain rings. Inside the lid of the box was more writing, which said that Gold Block was the finest pipe tobacco made from choice Virginia leaf. Barney threw the tin away in disgust and a voice said, All right, mister, come out. We got you covered. It was the Snargets. They'd played a trick on him and crept back. He came out of the shack and faced the Snargets. One had a broken down old air gun and the others were carrying pointed sticks. Cool, it ain't Albert, exclaimed the youngest Snarget. We can see that, said the oldest roughly. What's your name? He said to Barney in the same voice. Barney, said Barney. What's yours? I'm the Lone Ranger. He's Robin Hood and he's William Tell, snapped the eldest Snarget. Gosh, exclaimed Barney. Quiet, snapped the first Snarget. What was you doing in our shack? Yes, and what do you mean by chucking dirt at us? Asked the second Snarget. Yeah, and what are you doing in our damp anyway? Piped up the youngest fiercely. Can if I want to, replied Barney, pretending not to mind. But he was not really feeling very comfortable. He was not sure just how rough these Snargets could get. Can if he wants to, he says, exclaimed the Lone Ranger, as if he couldn't believe his ears. What should we do with him, fellas? Time to a tree and shoot him full of arrows suggested Robin Hood. Put him in a dungeon and leave him to rot, said William Tell. Nah, I reckon we ought to lynch him on the spot. String him up, said the Lone Ranger masterfully. We ain't got no rope, said Robin Hood. We ain't got no bows and arrows, pointed out William Tell. Well, there certainly ain't no dungeon for miles around, said the Lone Ranger. Let's just give him a bit of slow torture. You wouldn't dare, said Barney, but he didn't feel so sure. Oh, wouldn't we? sneered the Lone Ranger. That's what you think. We often do, don't we, fellas? Do it all the time, don't we? Give people the slow torture. Yes, and shoot them full of hammers, agreed Robin Hood. And put them in dungeons, added William Tell. I'd tell a policeman, said Barney stoutly. The eldest Snarget looked carefully around the pit. Can't see no policeman here, he said scornfully. I, I tell my granny. And she lives just up there, said Barney. The Snargets collapsed in owls of laughter. He'd tell his granny, he says. Hear that, fellas? He'd tell his granny. They cackled. Barney felt his face going red and tears coming into his eyes. Then he thought of something. I'm going to tell Stig, he said calmly. The laughter went on. He's going to tell his Stig, cackled the Snargets. But Barney just stood there and smiled and the laughter gradually died down. Who's Stig? said the eldest Snarget suspiciously. Oh, a friend of mine, replied Barney airily. Gone, ain't no such person, said the second doubtfully. Yes, there is, and he's my friend, said Barney. Where's he live? squeaked the smallest Snarget. Here, said Barney. Here, chorused the Snargets quite scornfully. What, in the damp? jeered the eldest Snarget, and they all laughed as if he'd made a joke. Yes, said Barney, didn't you know? Go on, you can't half tell him, said the second. What's he do? Tell us that then. 
He makes bows out of television aerials and arrows out of bits of flint, replied Barney. The Snargets gaped at him with open mouths. Look here, said the eldest at last. This here Stigion. What is he then? A boy or a man? Barney had to think a little before he answered then. He's a caveman, he said. At once the Snargets burst into jeers and laughter again. Yes, sorry old caveman. He's got it out of a school book. He's pulling our legs, making out he knows a caveman. Come on, fellas, let's do him. Slow torture, they cried. But Barney leapt off the pile of rubble he was standing on and set off at a run towards the other end of the pit. The Snargets were after him with shrill cries. He's off! Get him, fellas! You chicken, run away where we are! Barney jumped fallen tree trunks and burst through banks of nettles without caring for the stings. He knew the bottom of the pit better than the Snargets and he seemed to be leaving them behind. Then he heard the voice of the eldest. Take it easy, fellas. He can't get out of this end of the pit. Spread out so he don't double back. But Barney did not mean to double back. As quietly as he could, so that his pursuers could not hear him through the nettle banks and elder trees, he made for the entrance to Stig's den, flung himself through the low doorway and collapsed, puffing, blowing and pleased with himself on the floor of the cave. Stig was there, busy making himself a really horrible looking club out of a tree root into which he was fixing bits of flint, broken glass and rusty nails. Hello, Stig, panted Barney. I'm jolly glad to see you. But when he saw the horrible club, he began to feel almost sorry for the Snargets. He couldn't set this monster onto three little boys who hadn't really done anything to him yet. It may only have been a game after all. You never could tell with the Snargets. Barney just smiled uncertainly at Stig, and Stig returned him a friendly grin. Then, from outside, came the sound of the Snargets calling to each other. Has he gone met your way, Ted? No, I ain't seen him. Must be hiding round here somewheres. There were sounds of the undergrowth being beaten and stones being flung into bramble patches. Stig listened and looked at Barney suspiciously, but Barney made signs to be quiet. Cool, wait till I get my hands on you, Mr Barney, wherever you are, came the voice of the eldest Snarget. I'm all nettle stings on one side of me face. We'll roll him in the nettles when we get him, that's what we'll do. He sounded as if he meant it and Barney felt he was not quite so sorry for the Snargets. Footsteps crackling on dry twigs sounded quite close to the den. Barney moved further back into the cave and made signs to Stig to do so too. But Stig stayed near the entrance, bristling. Suddenly the voice of the youngest Snarget piped up excitedly. There's an owl here, an owl! Come and look at it! And a large lump of chalk came flying in through the entrance and hit Stig smack on the side of the head. Stig gave one roar and charged out of his doorway. Barney threw himself after to see what would happen. The youngest Snarget gave one pop-eyed, disbelieving look at Stig and turned and fled, sobbing and screaming, ah, It's a cave! It's a cave! It's a cave! It's a cave, man! The other Snargets who had been closing in when they heard the youngest cry of discovery saw Stig and turned and ran too. Wait for me! Wait! Wait! Don't leave me! wailed the youngest and then uttered a shrill scream of terror as he put his foot through the bottom of a rusty enamel bath and fell headlong. Help! 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 He's got me! He's got me! Almost as alarmed as the young Snarget, Barney ran up to where Stig was standing over the boy, who was shivering and moaning with fright and looked as if he expected to be eaten on the spot. But Stig was standing there looking down at the fallen William Tell Snarget with an almost fatherly look in his eyes. He bent down to help the boy to his feet and the Snarget moaned feebly. Don't! Don't! Then, seeing Barney approaching, he turned his eyes pitifully towards Barney and wailed. Don't let him hurt me! Don't let him hurt me! I wasn't doing no harm! But Stig kept hold of him, and led him firmly but gently towards his den. The Snarget gang, troublemakers though they were, were not as black as they were painted. Anyway, they weren't the men to abandon one of their number to his fate, and perhaps they too had an idea that violence was not always the way to get things done. Stig, Barney and their captive had not been long inside the den when there came the sound of hesitant footsteps from nearby. Barney looked out and there were the, the two other Snargets standing meekly together, unarmed and holding paper packets in their hands. The middle brother also had a handkerchief, which might have been supposed to be white, tied to a stick. We've got gifts said the one with the white flag. Yeah, said the other. 
We've come for the little one. Barney hesitated. You better come in, he said, but no tricks. Not likely, said the middle snarget. Not with that pella you on a bet. They came in through the doorway, saw a stick for the first time close to, and stopped, their eyes growing rounder and rounder. Then the second of them took a step forward gingerly, holding out his hand with a paper bag on it. For you, he said in a shaky voice, it's jelly babies. Stig took the little bag in a puzzled manner, squeezed it, smelt it, turned it about in his hands. Barney realised that, though he was clever at a lot of things, he was sometimes surprisingly ignorant about such things as paper bags. Then he turned the bag in his hairy hands, and one jelly baby fell out onto the floor. Stig's eyes widened, and he stooped to pick it up and held it to the light of the lamp which was flaming at the back of the cave, with a pleased expression on his face. Then he reverently stood the little sweetmeat in a niche in the chalk and stood and looked at it. You're supposed to eat it, Stig, said Barney, getting rather tired of this pantomime. It's delicious. He went across to the jelly baby's little niche and popped it into his own mouth. Stig looked horrified and Barney was afraid for a moment he was going to hit him. There's more in the bag, Stig, he said hurriedly. And he took the bag from Stig and opened it and showed him the other jelly figures. Go on. Eat one, he urged. Stig took one between his finger and thumb, put it slowly in his mouth and chewed slowly. Barney and the Snargets watched anxiously. Then a smile slowly began to spread over his face. The Snargets, who had been standing there strained and tense, sighed with relief and smiled too. Somehow everyone felt though some very solemn ceremony had been performed. Barney handed round the bag and all five of them solemnly ate jelly babies. Then the middle snarget produced his second gift, which was little bags of fizzy sherbet with hollow sticks of licorice stuck in them to suck it through. They sat down to this. After a little instruction, Stig got the idea of how to suck the fizzy powder up through the little tube, but as soon as he got a mouthful and felt the unusual sensation on his tongue, he jumped up with an alarmed expression on his face and began coughing and spluttering, and the snargets weren't sure whether to laugh or be alarmed too but Barney banged Stig on the back, which impressed the Snargets even more, and managed to soothe him down again. Finally, with a flourish, the eldest Snarget produced a packet of Woodbine cigarettes and handed them around. All three Snargets took one as if it was quite a usual thing, but this time it was Barney's turn to hesitate and wonder whether he should. As if he wished to show they were all friends now, Stig took one, beaming, and without even looking to see what the others were doing with theirs, put it in his mouth. The smallest Snarget suddenly exclaimed, Here, he's eating it! And before they could do anything, Stig had chewed up the little tube of tobacco and swallowed it with great satisfaction. The Snargets and Barney lit their cigarettes at the lamp. Barney immediately choked on his and threw it away and decided he didn't like smoking. The smallest Snarget puffed away and turned first white and then green. The other two smoked away quite happily, but Stig, though he ate another one, could not be persuaded to send up in smoke what he considered to be nourishing food. The Snargets began to feel at home. He's all right, your pal Stig, said the eldest Snarget to Barney. He don't say much though, do he? Don't he speak English? Smashing place you got here and all, said the second. Cool, look at all them old spears. I weren't really feared of him, piped up the youngest. I was just making out I was. Yes. Nor was we really going to do you any harm, Barney, was we, fellas? It's all just make-believe, weren't it? Reckon old Barney and his pal Stig were all right, eh, fellas? The others agreed in chorus. Barney felt a warm feeling inside now that the Snargets reckoned he and his friend Stig were all right. I'll tell you what, went on the eldest Snarget. Stig and Barney will be part of our gang from now on. Lord swear an oath, we won't none of us tell no one about this here den. Barney was going to agree, and then he thought, well, it was his secret first anyway, so why should he swear about it with anybody? But the Snargets swore a horrible oath among themselves over the body of the last jelly baby in the bag, which they then, they then cut the head off and buried to show what would happen to any of them who broke their oath. Barney felt fairly sure that his secret would not spread around the village now, and he felt somehow that Stig and the Snargets would get along quite well together. 
Barney was quite surprised when he got back to his grandmother's house to find he was in good time for lunch and Granny was just dishing up dumplings. Did you find something outside to do, dear? asked his grandmother. Not a very nice day. I had super fun with the Snargets, Granny. First I bombed them and then they were going to lynch me or torture me or something, but I got away to Stig's den and they thought Stig was going to eat one of them, but we ate babies instead. You know, jelly ones. Oh, said Granny. Aren't the Snargets rather rough boys for you to play with? Yes, but they're not nearly as rough as Stig. I reckon they're all right, said Barney. <laughs>